uh, I'm sitting here tonight with Kelly Schaefer, and she has just hit record on the webinar, so just be aware that the webinar is being recorded. We're here today to share a bit about patterns and trends that are distinguishable with the eBird database. And we're really focused on uh, middle and high school, and I think gonna share content well, that's well aligned with six to 12th grade students. But of course, there are uh, probably people in the audience who are not six to 12, and you can certainly adapt a lot of what we'll be saying for, for any grade level. And I'm gonna have Kelly just give you a quick introduction to Zoom in case you've not used it before. Yeah, so th for those of you who are joining us for the first time, Zoom is a really awesome platform, but there are a couple things that we can do to make it even better. So when Jen shared her screen, it probably went full size for you. So I'm gonna recommend that you exit full screen. You can do that by going to the options at the top of the screen or hitting escape. This is gonna allow you to dock the chat window at the side and see the conversation that's going on there. So once you exit full screen, go ahead and hit that chat button that looks like a speech bubble. And then over on the chat window side where it says to make sure that you're sending to all panelists and attendees. It defaults to all panelists. We wanna make sure it goes to all panelists and attendees so that we can have a conversation and you can share ideas and thoughts with your fellow teachers. Hey, why don't we go ahead and share with everyone in the chat window just to give it some practice. Again, setting to all panelists and attendees. Just share where you're calling in from tonight. Wisconsin and Texas and Arkansas. Someone in New York. Oh, hi, Jennifer. <laughs> Wisconsin. Oh, Portugal. You're sleepy. What time is it in Portugal right now? Ecuador, fantastic. How wonderful that we've got folks from all over the US and, and outside the US as well. Welcome everyone. We're thrilled to have you here. Wisconsinites, very excited. There's at least three people from Wisconsin. <laughs> all right, let me go ahead and uh, share just a little bit about the Cornell Lab of Ornithology if you're not familiar with us. We're a membership institution and we're located in Ithaca, New York. Right now in Ithaca, New York, it doesn't look like this with green leaves on the trees. It's quite chilly. Um, we have a tripart mission and that, that is to research, educate, and uh, provide citizen science focused on birds. And, and we definitely care a lot about conserving the Earth's biological diversity. And we'll be talking quite a bit about citizen science tonight. And Kelly and I are part of the K-12 team at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. We aim to create innovative resources and training that build your student science skills and help connect them to local habitats, help them explore biodiversity and engage in those citizen science projects. So that's sort of our themes, nature connection, citizen science and inquiry investigations really hands-on, engaging the whole student, getting them outside. And again, we do that through training, such as this webinar, and also through curricula and online resources, some of which we'll be sharing with you tonight. If you have any questions about anything, just let us know. Um, I think the topic that we're gonna be sharing tonight is especially pertinent because Recently, about six weeks ago, uh, the lab was a collaborative partner on a study that was published in Science Magazine showing that across North America, almost 3 billion birds have been lost. And that reflects a nearly 30% loss of birds um, across North America in just the last about 40 years or so. Um, it's, a, it's an immense loss and we think it's reflective of changes that are happening on our planet, including loss of insect biodiversity, climate change, and, and other factors. So the things that we'll be sharing tonight are real world and they help us understand what's happening to bird populations worldwide. So it's really important and critical. And I think for middle and high school students especially, who may not you know, just want to do things because you told them to. 
really appreciate the real world aspect of this and the connection to science of the things that we'll be describing tonight. You may have read about this report. It went pretty viral on many, many different channels, both local, national, and international news, how this crisis for birds is a crisis for everyone, and that we think that the decline in birds is a warning about the planet's well-being, because of course, since the early days, birds such as canaries have been the canary in the coal mine. Before we go any further, I just want to get us on the same page about citizen science. Maybe you've used citizen science projects in the past. If you have, feel free to share in the chat window. When I think about citizen science, I think about people reporting their observation using basic science protocols. That can be, as this picture sort of indicates, back, backyard projects to global projects. It can be outdoors and hands-on or computer-based. And it can be from the smallest things like looking through microscope at bacteria or pond water to projects that are truly uh, as big as the universe. And again, there's a connection with these citizen science projects that people, regular people, including you and your students, are helping scientists answer real world questions. And there are a wide variety of citizen science projects available now um, from birds, squirrels, stars, generalist projects like iNaturalist or Project Bud Burst, which looks at phenology of plants. Basically, if you're interested in a topic, there's very well could be a citizen science project that you and your students could participate in. And some of these projects, again, are worldwide. Some of them are more local in scope. And what I love about these projects is your counts really do matter. And I think that's super engaging for students to know that there's a connection to scientists and that scientists care about the data that they're collecting and that their data is helping to inform things like conservation decisions or health research, really important work. Tonight, most of our focus is going to be on this eBird Citizen Science Project. Do we have any eBird users among you? Besides Kelly and I. <laughs> awesome, I've seen some raised hands, awesome. <laughs> Thank you for your data. The data that you've submitted is, is helping us do some of the things that, that you'll learn about tonight. All right, I'm going to show you an image. At first glance, you might think, oh, that looks like a night sky image. It's not a night sky image. Guess what? <laughs> it's an image of where data has been submitted to the lab's citizen science project, such as eBird. And if you look closely, you'll even see some lines of data in the ocean. Maybe you have a guess as to what those are. You can see some countries lit up very, very well, like the United States. One reason the United States is so well lit up is because when the eBird project was released about 15 or so years ago, it was just a North American project. And now it's a global project, as you can see from this map. And so we've got data coming in from all corners of the, of the globe. I know US is still number one. I heard India is number three. Yeah, Do you India know what's the number up. two country? Where the I think it's still coming? Canada. Is it Canada? Yeah, but a lot of Latin American countries are rising in rank and India is coming up fast. So we've got data coming in all from the world. Those lines in the ocean are actually like shipping channels or um, cruise lines where people are doing birding from cruise ships. Pretty amazing database. Over a half million, a half billion observations have been submitted on about 40 million checklists by nearly half a million participants on over 10,000 species, which is like 99% of the bird species on the planet every country in the world at over 2 million locations. It's a really impressive amount of data that's coming in. And you can only imagine um, how much time 
that saves scientists. It's basically volunteer science, crowdsourced science. eBird's available to use both on a iPhone or Android app and also via the website. And in either case, we ask you a few simple questions. Where were you? What was the date and how much effort did you expend? And what species did you see or hear? For example, um, of effort, did you do a 10 minute point count, for example, in your backyard or at your school or at a feeder? Or did you go on a long, like three hour bird walk along a, a special trail in a national park or local place that you're fond of? And you can count or see the birds that you see um, or hear <laughs> along your way and submit that data and that constitutes a checklist. We have a really good question about how eBird accounts for wrong data. Do you wanna handle that, Kelly? Sure, so <laughs> eBird has a ton of protections built in it. Um, so behind the scenes in eBird are a lot of filters, and these filters are set by local birding experts, and they will flag species that would not be normally seen in that area, but even flag a number of species that would be unusual. So say you were outside and you logged 20 peregrine falcons. Well, that would be really unusual where you might get a, a flag in the app that would say, this is really high. Can you tell us more about this sighting? And you'd be like, oh wait, I just meant to put two. So there's some protections in there even as you're entering the data. Beyond that, if you submit data um, that seems strange or has tripped some of these filters, you'll get an email from an eBird reviewer who is a volunteer, again, a local birding expert, and they're just gonna ask you for more information on the sighting to confirm what you saw so that they know the data is accurate. So there are a lot of protections built into eBird. Have you gotten one of those emails, Kelly? Sure have. Me too. <laughs> Anybody else in our audience have one of those emails from the reviewers? They are here to help us learn and to help keep the database as, as clean and, and as accurate as possible. I see some raised hands. Some people get embarrassed when they get a flagged checklist and others of us wear it like a badge of honor. Hey. <laughs> the thing is, whenever I got that email, I was wrong. But sometimes you'll submit data that um, I was wrong about my ID. Sometimes I was wrong too. Yeah. Yeah. And there was one time I was right and then I had a picture and it was right. easy to fix. Yeah. yeah. So if you send a picture or a description of the bird, um, then they'll just accept it right into the database. If you're new to eBird or even if you've been doing eBird for quite some time, I want to make you aware of the eBird Essentials course. It's a free course and I think Kelly will put a link in uh, the chat window for the course. It will take you about two hours to get through, but it's going to give you everything from what eBird is and how our scientists use eBird data through how to uh, submit data and also how to get data out. So whereas tonight Kelly and I are giving you a pretty quick overview of eBird and of some of the educational resources that we've developed to support you in using eBird, this course is really a fantastic course that's gonna give you the details. We also are going to share, and Kelly will put a link in here too so it's easy and clickable. Um, we've re very recently developed some eBird lessons. In fact, they're not even completely finished and they're not available in print yet. But we're going to be developing some kit-based resources for teachers to use. And we've got one complete lesson from each of the grade bands available for free on our website. So we've divided these out K2, 3, 5, 6, 8, and 9, 12 in terms of grade bands. They're all tied to the NGSS standards and the Common Core standards. If you're in the US, you probably care about those things. And we've looked at each of these grade bands and, and asked ourselves, how can we best support students in doing eBird, in looking at eBird data, and in meeting the content that's appropriate for those grade levels? For example, for middle school, uh, key content is around bird diversity. 
So we're talking a lot about adaptations and bird diversity. Um, monitoring our changing world, the high school module is really about human impacts on the environment and populations and covers, again, content that's appropriate for high school through the lens of using eBird. Encourage you to download those lessons. Let's go through some of the, uh, the things in these lessons and also just give you some background on how we think about teaching bird ID and using eBird. And you know, you might have to think about how you might adapt it for kids that speak Spanish, for example, or kids at different grade levels. One of the initial tools we use is clues to bird ID. And we've developed a poster that we're going to print um, going over the four clues to bird ID. And these match up with inside birding videos that you might be familiar with. Um, Kelly, do you want to add a link to the inside sure. birding videos too, if you can come across it? The inside birding videos and that poster align. Basically, there's four clues to bird ID that the inside birding videos take you through. Uh, the first one is size and shape. Size and shape is important because when you start using that Merlin uh, bird ID app, one of the first questions it asks is how big is the bird? Is it tiny like a sparrow, medium small like a robin, medium large like a crow, or pretty large like a goose? And so we know that size and shape is, is important for for kids and adults to understand as they're judging and putting identification onto a bird. And I should bring this up for anybody that joined us a little bit late. If you don't have the Merlin Bird ID app yet on your smartphone or tablet, please take a moment now to find it in your app store. Start that Merlin Bird ID download. When you go to click Merlin, it's going to urge you to download a bird pack and go ahead and start that download. Merlin's a fairly large app, and so it can take a bit of time to download. All right, um, I'm gonna let you get started with that. In a moment, we're gonna show a Merlin video. And so you might see your screen glitch for a second as I turn on the sound. Okay, fantastic. Now when we play that video, hopefully the sound will be good for everyone. All right. Uh, one of the other clues to bird ID is color pattern. And the way that, that we think teachers should go about thinking about color pattern differs according to grade band. For example, at K2, you may not want to share many bird parts. Three, five, we use in the curriculum and you can find online um, various label diagrams such as the one you see here that overview the main parts of a bird. This helps with bird ID. For example, you know, if you've got a sparrow with a black throat and a streaky chest and a white belly, those are key characteristics to identify those birds. And so kids need to become familiar with some of the um, technical terms for the bird parts. At the 6-8 level and into high school, you might want to use our All About Bird Anatomy Interactive. Kelly's going to share the link in the chat window. The cool thing about the, well, there's a lot of cool things about the All About Bird Anatomy Interactive, but you can basically look at various anatomical features of the bird, such as the musculature, the skeletal system, the respiratory system, the digestive system, and as you click those, it will show you a label diagram on the bird. You can use the feathers part of the color pattern 
uh, interactive of the All About Bird Anatomy interactive. And when you highlight that, it will give you the names of all of those body parts, much like the three to five uh, diagram, only a bit more detailed. And it's cool because it's interactive. And there's a link in your chat window if you want to play with that later. All right. One last plea, get your Merlin app ready if you haven't already. In the high school curriculum, we have a, an activity where kids identify mystery birds, little brown birds, beach bums, mostly blackbirds, et cetera. And they use their Merlin Bird ID app to try to figure out and puzzle out these birds. And they do that in, in groups. So you can set something up like this, depending on your area. I realize we've got some folks outside the US that these are not your common birds, but at least for US users, um, we've got these materials developed that are more uh, ubiquitous US birds. We also, at the elementary, middle, and high school level, show kids a video of a mystery bird. Again, you could, do this with your own mystery bird video and help your kids use Merlin to identify a mystery bird. Our Macaulay Library of Natural Sounds is an awesome resource for bird pictures and videos and sounds. If you're not familiar with Macaulay Library, be sure to check that out as well. All right, let me show a quick introductory video to Merlin while hopefully your apps are finished downloading if they haven't already. And this will just give you a background. If you've ever wondered, what is that bird? Let Merlin help you unlock the mystery. Merlin is a new app from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It makes bird identification easier by showing you the birds in your own area that match what you've seen. Merlin asks you a few simple questions. When and where did you see the bird? What did it look like? And what was it doing? Almost like magic, Merlin shows you the most likely species for your area on that day. But these aren't wild guesses. Merlin knows which birds are near you by tapping into eBird, a database with millions of sightings from birders around the world. It finds out which species you're most likely to encounter and tailors results for your location. Browse Merlin's short list of photos to find your match. Once you know the name of the bird you've seen, a whole new world opens up. Listen to sounds. Learn more about where the species lives. Tell your friends about your new bird. Then go find another bird to identify. Merlin helps you to explore the most familiar birds in the United States and Canada. Whether it's your first time watching birds or whether you've always wanted to learn more, Merlin is ready to help. Download this free app from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology today. It's funny, when this video was made just a couple of years ago, I noticed in that screen capture that it said there were 243 birds available. Oh. There are now over 3,000 birds available, and they're available in many, many countries. So there are bird packs for North America, Mexico, Chile, uh, El Salvador, Costa Rica, Europe, Galapagos, and so on and so forth forth and you can download the the bird packs according to where you live or the places that you're visiting did you say 3,000 over 3,000 that's a third I know it's wow. impressive it's growing quickly all right let's take a moment hopefully if you've got Merlin uh, go through this with me live on your own phone and if you don't at least you'll know how to do this for the future so open your Merlin bird ID app and Kelly and I will do this live with you. And click Explore Birds, which is at the bottom, indicated by the red arrow. So you can use Merlin to 
identify birds, but you can also use Merlin to find out what your common local birds are. So open your app, click Explore Birds, and then there will be a slider in the upper right hand corner indicated by the right arrow or the red arrow. Go ahead and set your location to where you are and set the date either to today if you want to know what the common birds are right now or for example if you don't think you're going to teach this unit until spring you may want to set it for April or May or some other date. Sort by most likely, hit done, and it's going to give you a list of your most common birds. If you don't have, if you have an Android and not an iPhone, you won't see a done button, so just swipe the menu back to the side and it will reload. So for me, likely birds in Ithaca today, the top three, American Crow, Black Cap Chickadee, and Blue Jay. What did you do, Kelly? I did for Ithaca on May 1, and I have American Robin, American Goldfinch, Red Winged Blackbird, Black Cap Chickadee, and Blue Jay. Cool. Um, go ahead and add in the chat window if you're able to complete the activity. What's your location, and what were your, two, or your three top birds? And while you're doing that, I'll let you know how we use this in the curriculum and how we advise educators to use this in practice. Um, basically, while there are 10,000 species on the planet, you don't need to know 10,000 species to be a good birder or to participate in eBird. The best way to start is by coming, becoming familiar with your most common birds in your area. And so for me, I want to, for example, if I'm going to help my daughter, my eight-year-old daughter, become a, a better birder, I'm going to teach her these top birds, American Crow, Black Cap Chickadee, Blue Jay, Canada Goose, American Goldfinch. And if I'm a teacher, I might pick out, let's say I've got 25 students, pick these top 25 birds and assign one per student and let them become bird experts in those, in those birds. If each of your 25 students knows one bird each, then as a group, you know 25 birds. And, and that's mostly, um, those birds are probably the most common ones you're going to see. What are we seeing, Kelly? Lots of chickadees, black-capped and Carolina, lots of crows, dark-eyed juncos in Seattle, red-breasted nuthatch in Minnesota, Lots of gulls in Superior, Wisconsin. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Very cool. Hopefully that'll be a useful tool. You know, the other way that I've used this as a birder, if I'm going to a new location, I will pull up the location. For example, um, we went on vacation in Mexico in the Yucatan uh, last year, and I looked up the most common birds in Yucatan when we were going in April. And then I could figure out what I might likely see. And the birds that I didn't know, I could study. So it's a useful tool from that regard as well. If you have any questions about Merlin use or how, how we do this, feel free to let us know. Again, with this idea of assigning each student a bird, then they can figure out who is their focus bird. They can draw it. They can sketch it. They can watch videos of it, look at pictures of it. They can label their own field guide page. They become an expert in that bird. Kids love this activity. And of course, becoming an expert in a bird and learning a little bit about bird identification is a first step and a key to being a good eBirder. So eBird will help you put your bird identification skills to use, or your Merlin Bird ID app to use. We'll encourage you to watch and count your local birds, contribute the data to eBird, and of course, access the database. And here's a sample checklist that's included within those free lessons. You know, just teach your kids how to do a tally count and contribute that data to eBird. Let's go through some of the um, lessons in the middle and high school curriculum, just to give you a glimpse of what's there. The middle school curriculum is six lessons long. The free lesson is called Amazing Bird Diversity, lesson three. 
And in that lesson, you can see the learning objectives here. It's, it's about bird ID. It's also about the evolutionary history of birds and anatomical similarities and differences between modern birds and between birds and their prehistoric relatives, and also a bit about feather function. And again, this is free on the website. It starts with an article, Are Birds Really Dinosaurs? Talks about the types of feathers and some differences and similarities between modern birds and their prehistoric relatives. And then utilizes the wall of birds as an asset. So Kelly will share the link to this in the chat in just a second. But basically the wall of birds is an art installation at the Lab of Ornithology. It's on a big white wall, it used to be a white wall. And the artist, Jane Kim, painted in meticulous detail a representative of each of the over 240 living species of birds, as well as some of their prehistoric relatives going up the stairs that you can see there. The prehistoric relatives are grayed out. And then also there are a few modern birds that are now extinct, like the moa. Wall of Birds is really interactive, and while this wall lives at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, you can explore it from anywhere you are. For example, if you want to know more about the ostrich, you zoom into the ostrich, click the ostrich, you can read about it, you can hear its sound, you can find its range map, you can learn about the prehistoric relatives of birds. And the way that we use um, this as a simple engagement tool is we encourage the students to work independently or with a group to locate on the map, you know, some interesting bird. So I'm gonna invite you to just spend about three minutes exploring the wall of birds. Hopefully you have uh, access to a laptop or tablet. Maybe it's the one that you're using right now. Click on the link that Kelly shared and choose one that interests you. Maybe the most unusual bird, the most colorful bird, the species you'd most likely like to see in the wild, or maybe you want to go for the most dangerous bird. I'm just going to give you about three or so minutes to explore the wall of birds and kind of become a little bit familiar with that asset. So take about three minutes, and when we come back together, I'd love to hear what you, what you learned, what you explored. All right, I had fun exploring the wall of birds and I'll go ahead and share and then hopefully some of you will share in the chat window. I think the most colorful bird I just found on the wall of birds is the resplendent Quetzal. I think that might also be the bird I'd like to most see in the wild. That would be super cool. You can see the Quetzal in the picture on the screen, can't you? Yes, with the long green tails. 
I can see that it's found in Central America on the range map. What about everybody else? The great jacamar is a tropical rare bird, super colorful and cool. <laughs> the great gray owl, that could win the award for the most dangerous. I was thinking the red-legged Siriama. What is that? This, this one right here on the, standing up off of South America with his little gray tuft and his pink legs. He's dangerous? He beats his prey on the ground. Seems like a tough way to go. That's a bad way to go. <laughs> the Watson in Ecuador. Is that the one you'd like to see, Cassie? They're so cool. Atlantic Puffin. Super cool. Man, I love this interactive. It's awesome that we don't just get to see this cool painting, but that they've actually transformed it into a resource that's useful. And where we take it with students next is, you know, it's an exploration of bird diversity. How do the sizes and shapes of birds differ? How do the color patterns differ? How are prehistoric bird relatives different from modern birds? And how are they similar? So there are cool ways that you can use this interactive as an engagement tool for your students and as a learning tool, but also discuss some of the similarities and differences and sort of uh, build that content around size and shape, color pattern, and the characteristics of birds, which are all important uh, concepts, both for learning science as well as learning bird ID. Super cool. And again, that lesson is a free download and all the links are included, so feel free to use that. Uh, the next lesson that I want to share about is the 9 to 12 lesson in the Monitoring Our Changing World curriculum. And the free lesson on, on the website is Investigation 1. The cool thing about the high school curriculum is high school teachers were asking us not just for a lesson, but also uh, something that would meet the requirements of a lab. So each investigation is made up of two parts, a 50 minute lesson and a 90 minute lab. And there are again, eight different uh, investigations. So it's a very, very long involved curriculum and it's totally awesome. And as you can see, some of the learning objectives Students will be able to define citizen science and name a project focused on birds, describe why citizen science is important, define bioindicator, name three conservation challenges that birds face, define habitat, and name at least three major habitats in North America. One of the key things that are, that's utilized in the curriculum is eBird status and trends. So this is data out. We encourage students to, you know, connect locally and submit data, but also to use our cool data resources. When you utilize um, the eBird status and trends, you can see abundance animations and maps and trend maps. Let me give you an example. This is a trend map for the bald eagle. It's the non-breeding time, so this is the winter. And it's giving you a glimpse of the change in relative abundance according to eBird data and trends. Now you'll notice some of the map, some of Canada, some of the um, central and south, south, southern US is grayed out. That means that we don't have enough data or we don't feel that the data is reliable enough to make predictions. But you can see where we can make predictions, it looks like Bald eagle is generally decreasing in places like Idaho and the mountainous regions of the U.S., whereas it's increasing in most of the eastern U.S. And these trend maps are really a uh, really important aspect of helping us understand what's happening to bird populations. And I think we have trend maps like these for about 120 species. Mm -hmm. Another cool feature of that uh, website in eBird Abundance Maps. This is two species in January. 
One species found throughout looks like most of the U.S. and one species in January is not found in the U.S. but found more in Mexico. Let's look at an animation of that first bird, okay? When I start the animation, it's going to go through the year April, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October. Play it once more. If you have any guesses as to what the species is, feel free. This is an abundance map. So it, it looks at the expected count on a one hour, one kilometer eBird traveling count. So it's basically a measure of group sizes or the chances that, of how many you're gonna see. So you can see the, the purple is relatively high abundance, really high abundance. For example, here in, in the end of December, in some parts of, of New York and much of the Eastern US, you could see 325 of this species in a one hour, one kilometer traveling count. Super common bird, right? Any guesses as to the species? Here's the second map, and then I'll give, you, give them away. This is gonna be a very different pattern. Feel free to share any thoughts you have in the chat window. Play it again. Very different animation than the first bird. Yep, this one's a neotropical migrant. A Western species. Look at the relative abundance. Purple in this case only means about six birds, so it's a less abundant bird. Your counts are gonna be a lot lower on this bird. You wouldn't expect to see as many of them. I'll give it away. First bird, the American crow. And it was one of our top birds on, uh, that we sighted in our, e, in our Merlin exploration. Common throughout most of the US year round. And this bird uh, gathers in huge groups throughout most of the US, especially in the winter season. In fact, there are places in New York where you can see hundreds of these in one tree becomes even a problem for some people. How about that other one? Nope, don't think anybody guessed it right. The Bullock's Oriole. Very, very cool bird, not as common as the crow, but still found throughout most of the Western US, at least in the breeding season. And then our Bullock's Oriole spends a lot of the winter in Mexico in a smaller range. I think these neotropical migrants highlight in a really cool way how species don't see borders and how they rely on habitat in many different states and different countries. And so bird conservation is really a global issue. And how our citizen science data from across the US and across the world can really impact our understanding of what's happening with these species. Without citizen science data, we couldn't understand where these birds are and how their populations are doing. Why, why are they so different? Not just the annual cycle, but the abundance of these birds. Very cool questions. Well, we can explore those questions by looking at the All About Birds website. I looked, for example, at the American Crow page and learned that crows basically eat everything, including garbage. They're a very generalist species. They eat everything. And so they can be found in many habitats and they're super common. They're not specialists. 
The Bullock's Oriole, much uh, more limited in its food preferences. It eats insects, fruits, and nectar. So can't possibly see them in New York in winter because, or in the northern parts of Western US in the winter because there aren't insects and fruit and nectar for the species to eat. So this highlights for me that the idea that you can use eBird participation in citizen science as a jumping off point into all sorts of content areas. Adaptations, differences in beaks, differences in food and food and habitat. It's a great jumping off point. I think eBird can be a great grabber activity. And also important because it gives you an idea of, of your, your site. You can use eBird uh, data yourself on the website is best because um, on a phone or tiny screen, it's hard to see. But if you go online later and click explore, I love the bar charts feature. And you can use the bar charts feature to get at graphs like this. Here's an eBird frequency graph. So this is giving me the percent of checklists that say they saw that species, in this case in Ohio. All sorts of cool patterns. Which ones are migratory? We've got morning dove is blue, bald eagle is pink, northern mockingbird green, red-winged blackbird yellow, and yellow warbler purple. Yellow warbler is definitely migratory. Doesn't show up in Ohio until about April 1st. Breeds there and then generally gone by about October the 1st. Really common though in, in May. You can see that in Ohio, about 50% of checklists have the yellow warbler on it, on it in May. Red winged blackbird is another migratory bird, seen in very small numbers in the winter, maybe about 2% of checklists have uh, red winged blackbird in January, December through January, but then they, they breed in Ohio. And very, very common in Ohio in the breeding season, about 65% of checklists will see them in May and June. Something like a northern mockingbird isn't migratory. It's seen in Ohio year round, but on a very um, small scale, only about 5% of checklists, a less common bird. Again, cool jumping off point. You know, you could explore differences in what these birds eat, why they can live in Ohio. Some of them can live in Ohio year round, while others can't, that kind of thing. Truly, I think eBird data out is something that you could get lost in, like clicking around and, and exploring things. And of course, every time you, you do this, more questions come up. So that just gives you a glimpse of some of the ways that I think eBird is useful in your teaching from middle and high school. We, Kelly and I both love eBird. Yeah. We're always happy to talk about eBird. So if you'd like to reach out to us, you can. Uh, our group email address is k12lab at cornell.edu. Again, my name is Jennifer Fee, and I'm joined with Kelly. You can access our website there. We've got lots of free materials, and we've got uh, monthly webinars. We invite you to all of them. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, if you're so inclined. So we have um, another question relating to eBird data. And this is, this is a really good question and it's a further dive into um, what was asked earlier about the quality of data and whether eBird has protections against maybe kids saying that they saw a really common species in normal, normal numbers, um, but maybe it's not actually the one they saw. So for example, I'm thinking like, a chipping sparrow versus a swamp sparrow. 
which can look kind of similar and could be near each other in the habitat. So you, you might really be seeing chipping sparrows, but putting in swamp sparrows and it's not gonna trip one of those filters. Um, so it is, that is a little bit more challenging and as educators, and Jen, feel free to jump in with, with sure. your thoughts too. I think that's kind of partly our job as educators is to help steer them. And if we know that they're saying they're seeing something wrong, really pausing and going back to the fundamentals of bird ID, encouraging them to look for at least three specific field marks, asking them how they ruled out the chipping sparrow, asking about habitat, and is this really the right habitat for this bird? Um, some of that is gonna happen. I'm sure some of that happens on my list too when I'm out there. Um, and I, I don't know all of the protections that eBird has going on in the background. Um, and some of that, some of that probably will slip through. Um, yeah, a lot of that is going to slip through, but the main thing is eBird is such a massive database that statistically those small mistakes balance out. And we assume that a lot of the data is the correct data and close to the correct counts. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of comes out in the wash. And another thing you can do is if you're having trouble getting students to make a positive ID or they're not really ready to give up their ID on a particular bird, you can say, well, as the educator, you know, you can say, oh, I feel like maybe we need to revisit this bird's identification next time we see it. And we can put it in for now as a sparrow species. So you can go one step higher instead of trying to get down to the exact species, you could put sparrow SP in eBird and log your sighting that way. Um, but yeah, as Jen is saying, a lot of those, a lot of those sightings kind of get counteracted by the sheer volume of data. Yeah, we always encourage folks to, to eBird early and often. Mm -hmm. And don't be afraid that your data or your students' data isn't high enough quality to be counted. Mm -hmm. You know, even if you can count as a kindergarten class three species, the crow, the robin, and the chickadee, that's cool. That's okay. That's a great start. Mm -hmm. And then build your bird ID practice. I know that my checklist... 10 years ago were not as good as they are today. And I that, actually, yeah. that's something that eBird accounts for too. When, like, you know, we, we know that every data point isn't absolutely perfect. Mm -hmm. For sure. So we have a question about suggestions relating to initiating interest in older teens to engage in a bird lesson, especially for after school programs. Uh, I know in after school, it's particularly tricky. You have maybe like 10, 15 minutes of sit down time before the kids need to move. Um, I think that some of what Jen talked about with the 3 billion birds data can be really motivating and citizen science, talking about how citizen science is real world, that can be really motivating too. So I would suggest starting from a place of of why birds and why should they care about birds and providing maybe some perspective, big perspective on that. We've seen uh, even at high school level, some students become so interested in this material in class that some teachers have created before and after school birding clubs at the middle and high school level. Mm -hmm. So it, it is really engaging and, and uh, kids are likely to keep doing it you know, getting kids outside is cool. Talking to them as if, you know, using the, sci the terminology that they're helping science, they're becoming scientists, their data matters, it's going to Cornell University, um, I think can all be really motivating. We have a couple more questions that coming in and I'll get to those in just a second. We are at time, so I wanted to take a moment to let you all know that um, we have some options for getting credit for attending these webinars. So we do offer completion letters, just an informal letter for one contact hour from the lab. And if you're interested in getting one of those, just send me an email at the k12lab at cornell.edu email address on your phone and, excuse me, on your screen, and we'll get you that letter ASAP. We also have some credit options for um, continuing education units through Cornell. 
Um, those are a little more involved. They will involve creating an implementation plan and implementing it and or viewing more than one webinar. And I'm going to send a link if you're interested to those in the chat window. So Kelly and I will continue. I know it's the time is up, but we'll continue to sit here and monitor the chat window for a few more minutes. If you have any questions and, and if you're out of time and need to leave, but have further questions, don't hesitate to email us. We really appreciate uh, everybody being here and hope that you'll attend some future webinars and be able to use the eBird database in your own classroom practice and in your own personal practice. All right. And we'll just continue talking and addressing the questions. Um, and also invite you to respond to each other. I see a number of people that are interested in, in lessons for after school, outdoor education, that kind of thing. And thank you for, for helping us manage that. Um, I have a question about lessons for migration for middle school. Robin, we have a curriculum called Habitat Connections. It's available now, and I'll have Kelly put a link to that in the chat window. It has an awesome migration obstacle course, and it covers content related to, to habitats and migration. That might be a good resource. And that's a third through eighth grade curriculum. Yeah, we've got a recommendation for flying wild. I love bringing the art into it, Brittany, and having that be a way to get student interest. Thank you so much, everybody, for, for helping us manage the chat window. I'm going to be grabbing that link for Habitat Connections in just a second here. I love the idea to engage older teens via the tech. We've had a lot of fun working with teens here at the lab using like trail cams and iPads and binoculars. You know, bringing in the tools can be super engaging. Appreciate everybody being here. We will continue. Uh, Robin asking about how do I find pro Project Flying Wild. Just Google Flying Wild. Um, I think they sell um, books. They're very informal lesson plans. Most of what Kelly and I have been sharing tonight is more uh, curricula based. You know, the lessons build upon each other. Flying Wild tends to be kind of pick and pull lessons. Annette is asking uh, what the app is in the phone that they can identify photos of birds. That's the, uh, the Merlin app. If you can get a picture of the bird, we'll identify photos. The other app that people think of when they think of identifying photos is iNaturalist. That's not just birds, it's anything. Um, and that relies on an expert community to do the identification versus Merlin, which relies on the user to do the identification. Rochelle is asking suggestions for finding birds that appear in two specific countries, for example, birds that are both in China and the US. 
That's going to be a challenging one. Birds tend to stay in the Eastern Hemisphere or the Western Hemisphere with some crossover between, but not a ton. Um, yeah, the only thing I can think of is maybe some shorebirds that might. I'm thinking of invasive species. Oh, yeah. House sparrows, Eurasian collar dove. Starlings. Yep. So I might look at ubiquitous, like the most common birds in the world. Um, barn owl is a non-invasive species, but it's found on every continent. Yeah, they might not be in so, the Western U.S. much, though. Yeah, um, though, unfortunately, I can't think of like a, a way to search for both China and the Western U.S., but you can look at range maps of a ton of birds in the Western U.S. on allaboutbirds.org. Yeah. Um, and you might be, what well, you have to look at an eBird. Because e you'd have to look at the range maps in eBird. Yep. Look at the eBird range maps, I would suggest. It's not like that's searchable in an easy way. I would look at the most ubiquitous birds across the, the planet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's look at Barn Owl because that's a really good one, Jen. I'm glad you all are finding the webinars helpful. We're so glad. Well, I hope we'll see all of you on a future webinar. It's been awesome not only to have your participation, but also to have you uh, giving each other some information and ideas in the chat as well. Kelly's sending a eBird map to the barn owl. Photo ID says it has 5,000 birds for Merlin. How cool. That is cool. The computer visioning on Merlin was trained using, originally trained using crowdsourced uh, a crowdsourcing app online. It was pretty cool.